welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Dr. Gerard B. Wegemer. He's the editor, along with Stephen W. Smith, of The Essential Works of Thomas More, published by Yale University Press. And thank you so much for being here. Thank Dr. You. Gerard, you were on with Father Mitch. People remember you on with him back in March, uh, a couple of months ago. And of course, uh, we actually first talked in June of 1998, in the early days of Bookmark, on, on a book on Thomas More on statesmanship. That's right. So it's great to have you back here. Now, these are the essential works of Tom, the essential works, these look like the total works. <laughs> What's the idea of putting such a big book together? Well, it's the first collection since 1557 <clears throat> where we actually have all of More's major works together. Mm -hmm. And we have had that for every other major Renaissance author for the last 150 years. This gives all 20 of his books, 100 of his letters, mm -hmm. his poetry, and it gives also, in chronological order, the development of his own understanding of his own mission in life. Now, you say here in the, in the beginning, in the, in the preface, you talk about him being a distinguished lawyer, judge, and the first major author of early modern England. People don't think of him that way. No, but he is the first author, for instance, who learns Greek. Mm -hmm. Uh, in England. Most people have gone to the continent to do that. He writes Utopia, which is a bestseller even in his own age. Mm -hmm. He is the closest friend of Erasmus, of any Englishman. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to write... And who is Erasmus? Endorsed. We always hear that name, but who is it? Erasmus was the most famous intellectual uh, in, in Europe mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And he had a publishing empire to match none, except E.W. 10, perhaps. Okay. That, uh, <laughs> But he, for instance, <laughs> he, for instance, was doing first editions of all the classical authors and the church fathers mm -hmm. for a renaissance, that is, a going back to the sources. And Moore was intimately involved in this. And this is what his collection shows, how mm -hmm. much he's deeply, deeply investigating the issues of nature and of principle that a person needs mm -hmm. to know to be a free, uh, to a free citizen. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about he called both a man for all seasons, which of course people know from, from the play, and but he's also called a master mock. What's a master mock? Well, that was the criticism that he received from his opponents okay. in the Renaissance, in the Reformation, uh, that uh, Luther and his followers, he took their writings sentence by sentence sometimes and just ex explicated them mm -hmm. with his fitting sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so their response was, he's not taking us seriously. So although he's mocking he, them. Correct. Okay. They also say, Tudor historian Edward Hall wondered over more, I cannot tell, he wrote frankly, whether I should call him a foolish wise man or a wise foolish man. I'm assuming you have your own opinion. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and that was said right after Moore was executed mm -hmm. and made jokes on the scaffold. Mm -hmm. And he scandalized people like Hall, who thought that that was befitting and not, that was beneath his dignity as a world leader. Mm -hmm. But it shows his deepest understanding of human nature and his own role as a Christian. Uh, one of his earliest favorite phrases is, God loves a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. He writes that in his earliest works as a young man. So that comes from him. Uh, com he's, he's quoting from scripture. Scripture, right. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, but, but, he, but he reflects on this. Okay. And he sees the way you present something as part of what you present. Mm -hmm. And th this is also interesting to see throughout his life. He was an exceptionally um, effective and much loved mm -hmm. father, spouse. Uh, fellow citizen in London. Mm -hmm. He was the most popular lawyer in London, the highest paid lawyer in London. And his reputation is what um, uh, eventually led Henry VIII to ask him repeatedly to join his court. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, in the sense of looking at that situation, you would think about people today and you'd say, here's Thomas More. You know, in his heart he knew what he truly believed. So why wouldn't he have just said, well, I'll, I'll give lip service, as we would say today. But in my heart, God knows what the truth is. I think in a lot of ways, that would be a lot of people's reactions today. Right. And this is where Moore is a particularly helpful example mm -hmm. of speaking to people 
in a way that it helps them discover the truth. So his most famous work is Utopia. Mm -hmm. It is a masterpiece of irony. Mm -hmm. He says one thing, he leads us to see and discover something else. Right, right. He does this with his children. His children complain they're never sure if his father's serious or playful. Mm -hmm. But what he's doing is trying to elicit their own judgments. He's not imposing mm -hmm. on them the way to think. Right. He wants them, as he wants his fellow citizens, right. to be independent and uh, deeply reflective people. So another example of this is his emphasis on the term he brings back from Cicero mm -hmm. of a leading citizen. That's his understanding of what a statesman should be. Okay. Well, let me ask you, you know, you, you put this together and you've written how many books on Moore's life? Um, Four or five. Okay. So out of out of twenty books, a quarter of them you've written related to Moore. So why would you know what would be the difference between reading your wonderful books about Moore's life versus actually reading his original material? What's what's the difference for for the reader? What's the difference in reading Shakespeare and reading a second rate writer? Mm -hmm. uh, writing uh, about Shakespeare. Right. Okay. Uh, there's genius here, there's inspiration, and there is a time-tested wise individual. Uh, his, his dialogue of Sir Thomas More, which the bishops of England asked him to write in response to the, all the upheaval of the, Re of the Reformation, mm -hmm. they asked him to write it because he was the best English writer, but also he understood the issues mm -hmm. and could explain them in a way. He writes a dialogue between a confused college student and himself. Mm -hmm. He sets off parts of four days in conversation with this person. Right. And you see how he leads him to self-knowledge, to reflection. It's a masterpiece so of uses conversation. So kind of the Socratic method, which is why yes. you refer to him as Socrates. In Correct. Some way. Right. That's the idea. Now, you say here, the essential works of Thomas More aims to build upon and continue that work by presenting Thomas More anew to the great variety of readers and scholars interested in life writings and in this remarkable historical period, you say that you presented chronologically with brief introductions. Why did you decide to do it that way? We want this to be a teaching mm -hmm. book. So we've had the Riverside Chaucer, we've had the Riverside Shakespeare, it's one volume, uh, introductions. We also added outlines of each work, mm -hmm. imitating actually the, the great collected works of Aristotle that was done by the University of Chicago mm -hmm. uh, in the 40s because a good outline helps you to follow a very complex work. Mm -hmm. We also have the Essential Works website, which has study questions, study outlines in more detail. Right, and we can put that up to, so people can see where that is. You also, to provide a fuller view, a detailed chronology situates Moore's life and writings in a historical, social, and intellectual context, a reconstructed version of Moore's fateful trials also included. I thought that was really interesting because, you know, my limited knowledge of reading a couple of books and obviously seeing A Man for All Seasons, and to read that uh, actual trial, and I want to ask you where we got that information from, but how close that is to really the way it's obviously it's it's abridged in the movie but uh, and in the play, but it, you know, there's certainly the essence of it's the same. Were, were, were those notes taken by, you know, the scribes at the event or something, uh, the judges, or where did that come from? We have five different sources for that trial. Okay. One was from one of the judges, mm -hmm. another uh, was a report, uh, three were from reports that, of things that happened. Mm -hmm. One was from Cardinal Pohl, who was probably the best informed person on the continent, because he was a relative of Henry VIII, okay. and that were his his editions were not in Man for All Seasons, but the Man for All Seasons version, for what it gives, is remarkably accurate. Right. Yeah. And you talk about illuminating sections of the earliest biographical accounts of of Moore, mostly from those contemporaries who witnessed him in action one form or another, and you talk about their uh, Erasmus, William Roper, who people know from, and, and, and even Tyndale and, and Edward Hall. And from these perspectives, the different perspectives these people have, I'm assuming it gives you a more balanced and accurate picture of who Moore was, right? Correct, because he was a controversial character and has been ever since. Uh, he was the chief law enforcer, 
uh, and he resigned, uh, and he had a strategy of opposing Cromwell and Henry that not everyone agreed with or understood. I mean, why should he appear to be silent? Mm -hmm. uh, his silence, uh, Cromwell says, is causing other people to resist. Right. Where he would make the point that, in theory, silence might lead to consent. Correct. Right. Legally, so right. that he would force them to go through the legal process. Now, this is also fascinating mm -hmm. because Moore was as popular of a leader as you can get. He could have turned to rebellion and violence, but he actually wanted to give an example mm -hmm. of progress through law. And this is where when you compare him to other Renaissance figures like Milton, mm -hmm. Milton is part of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Milton justifies killing the king. Uh, Milton uh, is going to be on Cromwell's, his Cromwell's defense, mm -hmm. who does horrendous things. So uh, Moore has a hundred years in advance mm -hmm. uh, in mind. He knows institutional problems are not going to be solved easily. He plants seeds, which we've never really recognized before, mm -hmm. which do flourish in the years and decades ahead. So did Moore think he was going to be convicted? Not until Parliament passed a new law, and okay. then he saw it as inevitable. Okay. So was he totally surprised by Richard Rich, or did he expect something like that was going to happen? I think he was surprised by Richard Rich. Mm -hmm. It seems to have been, we're told that Moore lost his temper three times in his life. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been one time, because that perjury mm -hmm. would mean that not only would he be killed, but his family would lose all of their possessions. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a direct attack. And so Moore used everything he had to argue against Richard right, Rich. Right. To point out that uh, he wasn't well, that well thought of and things, you know, et cetera, in the past. That, right. uh, and he would be the last person he would have confided himself to, basically. Correct. Right? Correct. Which I think they also indicate in the movie. You, the, the final section calls a full text and I, of Sir Thomas More, the first dramatic depiction of Moore's life written by a group of London dramatists, including William Shakespeare. I never heard of that. This is how far behind we are mm -hmm. in Moore scholarship. Uh, you would think that the very fact that the longest example of Shakespeare's writing, which we have, it's reproduced in the book, uh, would cause scholars to look more closely mm -hmm. at Shakespeare's relationship to Moore. Mm -hmm. Now, these were five very diverse playwrights from very different religious, philosophic background, but they all agree in presenting this best friend the poor ever had, friend of London, mm -hmm. a, a leader that everyone looks to. It's a completely favorable view of Moore. Mm -hmm. Now, in this book itself, you talk about all 20 of his books are included, 106 of his letters, and 300 of his poems. So how would you rate him as a poet? His epigrams are among the best mm -hmm. in Latin ever written, and they were reproduced very often in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be published with, and they were published in 1518, uh, with Utopia. And they're another way of uh, actually judging Utopia, mm -hmm. because he has these extraordinarily powerful poems about the pride of kings, about the importance of consent of the governed, that authority comes from the governed, mm -hmm. not from the king. Uh, he balances that he has a dialectic between what's the best form of government, mm -hmm. hereditary monarchy, and, and Republicans, uh, where right. you have people elected every year and accountable to the people. Right. One he presents as blind chance, mm -hmm. and the other says as sure determination. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very clear when you think about his poetry and utopia together, mm -hmm. that he has in mind what are the deepest roots of English self-rule. Mm -hmm. He, Moore, which we include in the book, writes the first defense of free speech ever published right. in the West. Okay. And he gives a philosophic argument for why free speech is a necessary good mm -hmm. if you're going to determine good law. Right. Now, you also have, like I said, 106 of his letters. How revealing was he in when he wrote letters, or did it depend on who he was writing them to? 
The letters are, in a sense, the clearest window into Moore's soul, and mm -hmm. they are among the most charming, mm -hmm. especially the letters to his children, to his wife, to his friends. Mm -hmm. uh, th this was a person that Erasmus said was a, a model friend, born for friendship, and he actually writes his first account, Erasmus writes his first account of Moore's life, mm -hmm. as a model of the new type of statesman, someone who is dedicated to the law, dedicated to the people, mm -hmm. dedicated to the order of God's order, and a person who studies even while he's busy. Now, this is the other feature, I think, that the book brings out. Mm -hmm. This is a man who had a life of study, prayer, and contemplation from his youth to his old age. Mm -hmm. You have the records that he gives of his own spiritual struggles as a youth, uh, as he was achieving the pinnacle of his success. He challenges his daughter to a writing contest mm -hmm. on the four last things. And in the tower, we have some of the most moving mm -hmm. spiritual treatises ever written. Now, in going through his letters and, and looking at his writing, do you see him evolving spiritually throughout his life? In one significant way, and that's before he is brought to the tower, he writes that he's scandalized by himself mm -hmm. at how reluctant he is to follow what he sees as God's will, mm -hmm. and that he's, he's petrified with fear. Now this is a, and he also, his letters also reveal that he always considered himself a person of fear mm -hmm. and someone who didn't like pain. He's very honest. But you can also see in his tower writings, his marginal notes that he puts in his prayer book, and then these two masterpieces that he writes in the mm -hmm. tower. His own growth spiritually. And he ends up thanking God for treating him like a dangling, like a, like a little child, mm -hmm. in allowing him to be in prison to end his life. When he was going through his life, did he see himself more as a lawyer, a, a father, or a politician? Where, how did he manage all those? How did he balance all of those? In the proclamation to have Thomas More as patron of statesmen, the phrase unity of life was okay. used. And when St. John Paul II praised him, he praised him for his integrity especially and for being a man of conscience with joy mm -hmm. regardless of the cost. So Moore, through his own contemplative life, realizes that all these things are part of God's will, mm -hmm. his role as a father. He writes that if his children's good and education were to be sacrificed, he would give up his office. Mm -hmm. He takes those things very seriously. He waits until he's 40 years old to accept the king's invitation because he realizes that his children and his family need him for those early years. Right. Was he also reluctant because he suspected that he might be put in the position of something where he would find himself in opposition to Henry? Absolutely. Right. Moore knows Henry as a boy of nine years old. And when he writes a poem, to 17-year-old King Henry VIII. So it was about eight years difference then, based in Correct. Your, okay. Uh, this is a poem giving strong warning to, he compares Henry to a young Achilles, mm -hmm. uh, dragging Hector around okay. the, the, the chariot. Right. He realizes that there is a tyrannical tendency in this young man. Right. And he's got a heel that is there too. Correct. Well. And he has many poems about lions um, as kings, and uh, if you're their trainer, you've got to be careful. Right. You also had in the beginning here, there was, uh, after the preface, there was like a cron of different people, and, and I think uh, John Morton. Who was John Morton? John Morton was the one who ended the War of Roses by uh, negotiating the marriage between the white and red rose, between mm -hmm. the two branches of the, the uh, claims for kingship. Right. He was the head of the church in England, and he was the Lord Chancellor. Right, and so you see there, again, the, that melding happening. Correct. Right. Correct. 
but he was one of Moore's earliest teachers. Right, because he seemed to have an impact on Moore's life. Right? He convinces Moore's father to send him to Oxford. Mm -hmm. The father's reluctant. And uh, he is a figure in both Utopia and Richard III, mm -hmm. as a person of prudence who grows. And when he, he met Erasmus in 1499, how old was he and how old was Erasmus? Erasmus was roughly uh, 12 years older than Moore. Oh, okay. So he was impressed with this young man then. Obviously. Very much. Obviously. And the fact that y you mentioned that he would have written something so prescient at nine years old obviously indicates that, uh, that Moore was somebody with an incredibly high intellect at a young age. Erasmus says he's the one genius of England of really? his time. Uh, and, and he's clearly a genius. He, he can master Greek in three years. And he, trans he, he, he challenges Erasmus to a Greek translating contest. Mm -hmm. And he challenges Erasmus to master Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, so to master Greek so you can translate one of the hardest writers there is in mm -hmm. three years, you've got to have, you have special equipment. So what would you say to, uh, there was a program, Wolf's Hall, that was done a few years ago, where uh, Moore didn't come out very well in that particular. What was your impression of that? Did you see it? Uh, I read the book. Right. It's called historical fiction. Mm -hmm. It's definitely fiction, mm -hmm. because she inverts the roles. Yeah, that's what it seemed to be. The right, virtues right. of Moore she gives to Cromwell. Right. And we have historical record about how close Moore was to his children, mm -hmm. uh, how they loved each other, the tender love that they had for each other. Uh, we have no records of that, of Cromwell. Right. Uh, that's interesting that, they, they, in a sense, they project that onto uh, Cromwell. Correct. Yeah, it's exactly what you felt like when you were watching. You were like, wait a second, I'm, I'm like in a parallel universe here or something yeah. where everything flipped back and forth. So, I mean, when somebody takes a book like this on, are, are there, is it a reference book? Is it something you go and you pick and choose what you, you're interested in reading on any given day? Or you don't start at, do you start at the beginning and go to the end? How should somebody use yeah. this book? For anyone interested in the complete Thomas More, the full life of More, this is a book you can read throughout your life mm -hmm. and return to. Uh, th there would be things you'd read first. Right. So you'd probably read the last writings first. Okay. His masterpieces in the tower. They're accessible to everyone. And that would, in a sense, get you interested enough to read the other parts. Correct. Okay. Correct. But also his letters, uh, magnificent. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually designed as a textbook for uh, college or grad school. Right. To be able to give someone a, a text that they could study the rest of their life. It's also, as any collected work of mm -hmm. Milton or Shakespeare, uh, for scholars who will have a readable version. So, for instance, one of the arguments we made to publish this book was to quote Moore's English writings was the equivalent of quoting Shakespeare's first folio. Mm -hmm. First folio had no standardized spelling, right. no standardized punctuation, impossible to read right. for most people. For modern day people to understand Correct. what he was trying to say at the Correct. time. Correct. Right. So this has 19,000 footnotes giving right. every word that needs to be explained, and it has standardized spelling. Right, and then understanding how the word was used in that context. Correct. Where it maybe uses Correct. different meaning today. Which Correct. We, we know. Well, what about, I mean, Thomas More, Essential Works, it seems to be, and I would think you would believe, that he is really a man for our times, and we really could use him now. I'm assuming you believe that. Why would you tell people that knowing him is important? He understood politics as a way of serving the common good, mm -hmm. and he understood intellectual gifts as gifts to use for the common good. Okay. And this is where he does show a very important example of one of the most tumultuous periods of history. One of the principles he gives in his letters to his children for their education mm -hmm. is to develop a calmness of soul mm -hmm. that will be indifferent to what other people say so their reason can work, mm -hmm. so they can hear their conscience. And for instance, another extremely important part that anyone would start with would be Moore's 12 uh, principles of spiritual combat, or right. his 12 properties of a lover. Well, that's a good uh, promo for people why they have to read this book, because we're just out of time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gerard B. Wegemer.
you're very calm, just like Thomas Moore, along editing with uh, Stephen W. Smith, The Essential Works of Thomas Moore, published by Yale University Press. Put a website up where you can find out how you can get it. And thank you so much for joining us here on EWTN's Bookmark. It's always a pleasure. Thank you.